If you take a look at this figure, you can see a modern classification that is based on using uh, ribosomal RNA gene comparisons. And from this, people are starting to classify different organisms that are out there. And in the one that is pictured here, uh, they came up with what they called four divisions of bacteria and archaea, the prokaryotic cells that are out there. And they sort of used these divisions and also started looking at some of the different kinds of um, diagnosis that can be used to characterize the cells that are out there. So you start out with your ribosomal RNA genes and you can break them up into different divisions. Other people are using gram-negative and gram-positive cells, so looking at the cell wall differences that are out there. And once you have those categories set up, then you can start to move on to different kinds of categories. So you can look at things like the cell shape, the arrangement, the structures in the cells, um, what about their metabolism? What do they eat? What do they poop? Do they need to have oxygen available? So all of these can come into our um, taxonomic classification for these different kinds of microbes that are out there. And if we take a look at this one, you can see this modern one. Um, currently, there are 29 accepted phyla for the bacteria. So remember, domain, kingdom, phylum. So this is high up in the hierarchy there, and it's a more general idea. And if we look at Berge's manual, they actually divide these organisms up into five different um, volumes that are out there. And just to show you, I don't expect you to memorize all this stuff, but I just wanted to show you how they group these together. In volume one, that's where they put the archaea and some of these weird kind of things. And I'm going to jump back here. These deeply branching kind of things that are out there and also the phototrophic bacteria. So the bacteria that can do photosynthesis that we can see over here and some of these little guys over here. So all of those were grouped together because it was convenient. And then they have this huge group with what's known as the proteobacteria. And notice there's a huge number of different kinds of species of proteobacteria. So they threw all those guys together in that volume. And then they started to look at some of these guys over here with the gram-positive bacteria that are out there and dropped them into all these different groups. So if you want to, you can read through the chapter, and I'm just going to briefly show you some of how we can break these up. And this is what's known as a dichotomous key. And so you can take a bacteria and say, does it cause a disease in humans? If it does, then you go over to this side. If it doesn't, you go over to this side. And with the alpha proteobacteria, these are all gram-negative bacteria. So that could be up here on the top, gram-negative. And then you work your way down. And just to show you, again, I don't expect people to memorize all these things here. But this includes things like pathogens that cause um, diseases in us to things that are over here that are found in the soil that can actually grow into the nodules of something like an alfalfa plant or a bean plant that is out there in the legumus um, group right there. So really kind of interesting that we would group these kind of bacteria similar to the ones over here that are causing diseases. But again, this is based on ribosomal RNA DNA comparisons. Those indicate these are to be grouped together. If we look at the beta proteobacteria, again, gram-negative bacteria that are out there, you can see that there's a couple of different breakdowns here. Some of these you can find out there in the soil and in water. Here is the Neisseria group that can cause gonorrhea or meningitis. Um, you can see some of these different weird kind of things, even including the bacteria that causes whooping cough. So again, this isn't all the bacteria that are out there. This is the beta proteobacteria with some of them just broken down um, in this dichotomous key. So you can see the diversity of these organisms that probably had a common ancestor at one point, and then they have um, diversified for the different environments. The gamma proteobacteria, again, another one of those big kind of um, groups of organisms that are out there, include things like the organism that causes Legionnaire's disease to the organisms that cause cholera. So you drink contaminated water and you end up with a serious case of dysentery or diarrhea. And then down here we can see this enterobacteriales. Um, this group of organisms that is out there um, includes the intestinal bacteria, or what's known as the enteric bacteria. So things like E. coli and salmonella are both um, gram-negative um, bacilli, 
that have peritrichous flagella. So they have flagella all over the surface of the cells right there. And obviously the E. coli uh, tends to be more helpful for us and the salmonella is causing diseases. When you look in the Delta proteobacteria, I just pulled out some interesting um, examples on these. Della vibrio over here is actually this little kind of weird um, bacteria that is vibrioid in shape. It looks like that little comma there. But this little guy has this nice long um, polar flagella, so it's monotrichous. And this thing can swim at 160 micrometers per second. So if you think about it, if you were looking in your microscope, these guys would be swimming across the field of view in less than a second there. And they run up to other um, gram-negative bacteria and they will actually break through that outer membrane and they hang out in the periplasmic space um, where the cell wall is. And the Della vibrio is actually going to be feeding on the proteins and the nucleic acids of those host cells there. So really kind of a weird one. And then these guys over here, will actually um, have gliding cells so they can almost swim across the surface of an auger plate and they will actually accumulate and start to grow up and form what's called a fruiting body and they make little spores inside of these sacs here. So very, very interesting kind of features of these organisms that are grouped together because of their um, genetic composition. When we look at the epsilon proteobacteria, some interesting kinds of things. Um, again, gram-negative rods, and we've got these campylobacteria bacteria, and you can see these cause some intestinal diseases, and also they can result in spontaneous abortion in animals. Um, uh, I don't want to say a common, but this is an infection that can actually um, infect pigs and spread throughout the whole colony of pigs there. And then helicobacteria over here is a really weird one because it turns out this bacteria is what is actually responsible for causing ulcers. And a few years ago, some scientists in Australia actually got the Nobel Prize because they found that ulcers weren't just caused by stress. It turns out these little bacteria were um, aggravating um, the intestinal lining and, or the lining in your stomach and that was causing these gastric ulcers. So you actually take antibiotics to get rid of ulcers instead of drinking milk, which actually can aggravate the whole situation. Um, when you look at the gram positives, they are basically divided into two different groups based on their DNA composition. So they look and see um, the percentage of G's and C's in their chromosomes that are out there and divide them up into low or high ones. And here we can see a dichotomous key with a high GC. And there is our old friend, the acid fast positive bacteria, the mycobacterium that cause things like leprosy and tuberculosis. You can see some of these other gram positive things and then you've got this extra little gram negative. They are lacking a cell wall and there's a little guy that you'll find um, causing acne or also this um, genus of bacteria includes the bacteria that's used to make Swiss cheese. Over here you can see some of these really interesting kinds of bacteria that actually grow as these long thin filaments. So these guys um, actually look a lot like a mold growth that's out there and they will have these spores on the end of them. So really some interesting divisions when we look at all of these bacteria that are out there. There's a lot of information included in this chapter and what I really want you to focus on is think about the differences that can be used to classify these organisms over here in terms of um, prokaryotic cells that are in that domain bacteria. And what we really want to focus on is this domain archaea over here. So focus on the first two sections from the chapter and then the last section from chapter four where we're going to look at the characteristics of this domain archaea. And when we look at that, remember they are prokaryotic organisms and they seem to have evolved separate from what are known as eubacteria or true bacteria. Uh, we find the archaea all over the place. They are very abundant in the ocean and the problem is we need to find the right conditions to culture these things. Um, they also tend to live in some extreme environments, as we see. So culturing them in the lab is going to be a little bit more problematic. They have not been found to cause diseases in humans. And there is really only one reported case of them growing on or in people. And that was a guy who had not showered in five years. And they took a sample out of his belly button to see what kind of microbes were there. And that's where they actually were able to pull up an archaea gene. So they think 
that the archaea was living there, but it could have been contamination from the environment. And when we look at these guys, a lot of them, the classification is difficult because we have not isolated them and grown them in the lab. We've only detected them by looking for their gene sequences when sampling environmental um, samples that are out there. And here I just pulled up some um, different examples to show you. When you look at the archaea, they're going to be similar to our bacteria. They're going to be in that 1 to 15 micrometer range for size. They also come in a variety of different shapes, um, the common shapes that we see with the bacteria. So your coccus, your bacillus, or your spirals. But here we can also see this weird long filament when you look at thermophilium. Um, Halo quadratum, we've seen an example of this. It comes as these four bacteria cells that are growing together. And this is a really interesting one. It's known as pyrococcus. And this organism actually grows in extremely hot temperatures. And you can see this tuft of flagella coming off the side of the coccus there. Um, so these guys are lophotrichus when you look at their flagella. And when we look at the domain archaea, remember, this is a separate domain because Woes and Fox proposed this idea in the 1970s and said, we have prokaryotic cells, but it looks like there are two different groups of them that are separate from the eukaryotic cells that are out there. And when we look at the domain archaea, well, what are some of these differences from the other prokaryotic cells that are out there? And the one that we see over and over is this idea that you can look at those ribosomal RNA gene sequences and the domain archaea, their sequences that make up um, this ribosome structure over here, their sequences are different from the bacteria and they're also different from the eukaryotic cells. So that's one way to group them. We can also look at their cell wall. And when you look at the archaea, their cell wall is made up of proteins, and they can also have pseudopeptidoglycan. So rather than peptidoglycan, which has NAG and NAT chain or NAG and NAM chains, when we look at pseudopeptidoglycan, they shift the NAM becomes the NAT molecule there. So it's NAG and NAT ch um, sugar chains that are also held together by those peptide bridges. The third difference that we can find in these guys is with the phospholipids that make up their cell membrane here. And if you remember your cell membranes, um, those molecules that are making it up, the phospholipids, are actually going to have two parts to them. They have a charged head and they have these nonpolar lipid tails right there. Those are going to be connected. If you look at this figure over there, there's your charged head, and then you've got a glycerol molecule, and there is your long fatty acid tails coming off of the end of this thing here. So when we look at this, the phospholipids that we find in bacteria and eukaryotic cells, you've got your glycerol with your phosphate, and then these two chains coming off of the side right there. These are linear chains. And if you look at the archaea, you can see there's a little branch that is built into some of these things. And when we look at it, the archaea use a molecule known as an isoprenoid that we'll see in Chapter 7 when we get to there. But those molecules, when they're packed together to make this long chain, have that extra branch right there. And if you think about it, they've got an extra branch to this nonpolar lipid tail that's going to make this thing even more hydrophobic. And they think this is going to keep the um, archaea membranes from leaking at higher temperatures there because it is more hydrophobic potentially than these guys here. Another example that we can see is if you look at these two diagrams here, you can see that in bacteria and eukaryotic cells, it's actually a phospholipid bilayer. You've got your charged heads on the outside and your fatty acid tail, lipid tails on the inside. Well, what some archaea actually are doing is they're taking those branch chains and actually they are attached. So you've got one long chain. So instead of having a bilayer with two layers of phospholipids, they actually have a monolayer of this. And again, this is going to be more stable in those hot temperatures where your bilayer is going to be able to break apart in these directions here. It's not going to be able to come apart so they can help these cells to survive in harsher environments where a bacteria might not be able to survive there and definitely not a eukaryotic cell. And the last big difference that we can see is when you look at the actual chemistry of the molecule itself. 
Um, if you look closely at this, you can see highlighted in yellow right there that there's actually a difference in the bonds between these atoms that are making up the molecule and the connection between your fatty acid tails and your glycerol in the archaea phospholipid is an ether bond. If you look at this in your bacteria and your eukaryotic cells, they both use this ester bond right here. The other thing for those of you who like chemistry is if you remember, there's something known as stereochemistry. And you can see this if you hold up your left and your right hands in front of your face. If you were to take a left-handed glove and try and put it on your right hand, it's not going to work because it's a mirror image. When we look closely at this glycerol here, these are mirror images. You can see that these are coming off of those top two carbons, whereas these are on the bottom two. So even the handedness, left versus right handedness, if you will, is different when we look at these phospholipids. So you got the branch chains, you can have those um, mono layers, and you also have the differences in terms of the bonding between these chemicals. If we look at um, where we can find some of these organisms growing, we can um, divide the archaea up based on the habitat, so where they grow. And one environment where we find them is what's um, known as a halophilic environment. And halo comes from the Greek for salt. And so these guys will be found out in the Dead Sea. And here you can see what's known as a halobacterium. So it literally, the name translates to salty bacteria. And these guys will live in environments that can be up to 36% salt. So take a cup of salt and add two cups of water. And that's where they live. And if you fly into the airport in Oakland or San Francisco, you can see these huge ponds out there next to the bay. And this is where they're actually letting seawater in and they allow the water to evaporate to collect the salt out of there. Well, in these salt ponds is where you actually get these archaea growing. And you can tell they're there because they actually do have a pigment that they think is involved in um, absorbing light. And so that's where we see this purple color right here. Another group of archaea that we can find are what's known as the thermophiles. And these guys grow in higher temperature environments. And when you look at the structures in the cells, so think of their membranes, the proteins, and these nucleic acids, they actually don't function properly below 45 degrees Celsius. And remember, we are 37 degrees Celsius on average. So for us, we're too cool for these organisms to be able to grow properly. And you can find them out in things like this, a nice little um, hot water well or a spring out there in Yellowstone. And the archaea are actually this orange bacteria that are growing around here. There is a group of them out there that are known as hyperthermophiles, and they like extremely hot temperatures, so temperatures above 80 degrees. And if you remember the pyrococcus that I showed you earlier, the name literally translates as fiery sphere pyro for fire and caucus for the sphere and those guys are hyperthermophiles that actually grow in temperatures above 110 degrees celsius water boils at 100 degrees so those organisms actually grow in boiling water and when we look at these archaea just to sort of show you some interesting a lot of these features can be shared and so if you look at this guy there's actually a scientist that is crawling around in a volcano crater and they isolated this bacteria right here that grows in these volcanic rocks um, at 55 degrees Celsius. So slightly elevated, certainly hotter than what we're used to. But what's amazing is when they looked at the environment there, they tested the pH and found that the pH surrounding the cells is actually 0.7, which is the equivalent to battery acid. And if you were to spill battery acid on your skin, your skin would dissolve. These cells maintain an internal pH of 4.6, which is still on the acidic side, but they actually have membranes built in, or pumps built into their membrane that are going to be pumping protons out of the cell here, using a little bit more um, energy for the cell there. The last group of archaea that we can find based on habitat is what's known as methanogens. And these guys are found living in um, the mud at the bottom of oceans and lakes. And some of them live in the colons of animals. And what they do is they're going to convert organic waste. So think the stuff that's traveling through the cow. 
and they will turn those into methane gas, so CH4. If you remember from the chemistry thing, this is the simplest organic molecule that's out there. These cells are producing methane gas, and when they look in the ocean, they estimate we're talking about 10 trillion tons of this gas is buried in the mud on the floor of the ocean. And if you have an earthquake in the ocean, they think that can actually disturb the mud and you will get this massive release of methane gas, which turns out to be worse than CO2 at warming up the atmosphere of the planet. So we hear about CO2 as this is causing global climate change. Well, it turns out bacteria farts might be even worse than the CO2 that is out there at increasing the average temperature on the planet. If we look at this idea, the archaea are constantly changing as we discover um, new ones. And this is one that I found that's a, a more recent update than what we have over here because more and more archaea are being found. And you can see that um, two of these categories aren't even included on this original diagram there. And if you look at this, a lot of these are coming from hot springs. You can see there's some methanogens, some halophiles, thermophiles. So that idea of grouping them based on habitat isn't working. And that's why we look at the ribosomal RNA genes that are out there. And this one is really an interesting one. They've only found four different species of it. But these guys are involved in recycling carbon and nitrogen in the environment. And it turns out vitamin B12 that we get actually seems to come from bacteria that are out there. So if th this bacteria dies off, there's going to be a massive die off of other organisms on the planet that depend on this thing to produce their vitamins for them to be able to su succeed out there. So again, when you're looking at chapter four, focus on the stuff at the beginning of the chapter and at the end of the chapter. If you're interested, read through the rest of the chapter and you'll learn a lot more about the diversity of the different microbes that are out there.